So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for the first of PARC's uh, webinar series for 2016-17. Today we're going to be hearing from Brandy Tannenbaum who will be presenting Are We Doing It Wrong? Physical Activity, Risk and Resilience. Um, before we get started, I just want to provide a quick overview of PARC for those who may not be as familiar with the organization or with the services that we offer. The PARC is the Center of Excellence for Physical Activity Promotion in Ontario. Established in 2003, PARC provides support to physical activity promoters working in multiple sectors in Ontario. PARC is managed by OFIA, a not-for-profit organization led by the vision that all children and youth value and enjoy the lifelong benefits of healthy, active living. So while PARC and OFIA work with different audiences, OFIA having more of a focus on children and youth, while PARC works across the lifespan, both organizations complement each other in highlighting the shared responsibility of creating and maintaining healthy schools and healthy communities. PARC supports physical activity promoters working across the lifespan in public health, recreation, sport, fitness, community and family health, as well as non-government organizations. The park provides professional learning and networking opportunities as well as quality resources and consultation services to enhance the capacity of physical activity promoters across Ontario. Uh, right now, we're really excited to announce that along with this webinar in our professional speaker series, we also have an upcoming webinar in partnership with Participation Action around the release of the 2016 report card. Um, so that webinar will be offered in English on June 28th and in French on um, Wednesday, June 29th. So you can learn more about that on our website. Um, this year we're also playing a, uh, placing a much stronger emphasis on research to support knowledge mobilization as well as our consultation. So we're just going to put that out there and hope that you keep an eye out for uh, some of our research products that we'll be disseminating soon. Um, PARC has also proposed revisions to our policy workbook in 2016-17. Some of you may be familiar with that. So if anyone on the call is interested in being part of that process, either as a contributor, reviewer, or maybe in sharing case studies that you've worked on, um, please feel free to contact us at any time. And finally, we're really excited to announce that PARC has recently launched a new blog. So if there's anything that you think would be uh, interesting content for the blog, or if you have stories from your community um, that you'd like to share, you can also get in touch with us about that. So the PARC website, just very quickly, is our one-stop shop for all things PARC related. It is bilingual and includes an event page for physical activity related events, as well as a life stage selector that helps you easily find resources and professional learning opportunities that are most relevant to you. Um, all of our services can be found on our website and we encourage you to take to come back regularly to see what's new. So our webinar today is presented by Brandy Tannenbaum. Uh, Brandy has a passion for driving community health through sport and physical activity. She has more than 20 years experience working at local and provincial levels in sport and recreation always with a consistent focus on creating safe and healthy experiences. Since 2009, as a program coordinator at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, Brandy co-leads PlaySafe, a national collaborative aiming to reduce injury and physical activity through research and innovation. Brandy is a certified risk manager and has a master's degree in public health. Away from work, she has a busy family life with two young boys who regularly <laughs> challenge every risk management principle and injury prevention technique, but she wouldn't have it any other way. So thank you very much for being here today, Brandy. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I, I think I've unmuted myself. Can somebody confirm that? <laughs> can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, awesome. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, again. Um, uh, Sarah, thank you to OzPAC for the opportunity to present today and to PARC for the, uh, the, the technological uh, support uh, for the, the webinar. Um, before we start, you should know this about me, I'm a bit of an agitator uh, and I like to challenge the status quo. So um, uh, I, I want to just question everything that we're doing and see if we can uh, find ways to improve. Um, but at, but at, at the heart of it, I, I want to challenge what we're doing uh, at present, uh, always with a, an aim to, uh, to improve healthy outcomes uh, in our communities. And I also think that with injury being a leading cause of death for young people, uh, we can stand to consider some out-of-the-box ideas uh, on this topic. So um, before I get into the presentation, we're gonna we're gonna I've done this activity um, in a room with people that I can see, but we're gonna try this online 
today and see if we can uh, if we can make this work. So I want to get you into the frame of mind for thinking about um, uh, this topic and in particular uh, risky play that we'll get into uh, later on in the presentation. But um, and I can't see you, so I, I can't actually see that you're, you're you're doing this. But let's give it a try anyway. So I'd like you to close your eyes and uh, think back to a time when you were 10 or 11 years old. Uh, think of a time that you're playing. Um, I want you to think about these pieces. Where where are you in this moment uh, that you're remembering? Who are you playing with? Are you by yourself or are you with someone else? I want you to think about what you were doing and how you're feeling in this moment. Uh, was there an adult supervising? And did an adult know exactly where you were at the time? So give give that some thought. And then... If you can, I would love it if, uh, if some of you feel comfortable enough to type into the chat box uh, some of these experiences. You don't have to be detailed, of course, but where are these some of these? Where are some of these uh, activities taking place? What are some of these memories that you have uh, that, that came to mind so so easily for you? I see the uh, uh, climbing a tree in my backyard. Perfect. We'll give uh, give everybody a, a minute or so. Playing baseball with friends. Oh, a forest behind the house. Yes, that is fortunate. <laughs> I build forts and trails. Awesome. Forts in the woods. Okay. Oh, the swing set stories. Yes. The bogganing. Awesome. Hey, thanks for contributing. That's, this is great. Excellent. I, I, so uh, the next question. Um, actually, let's try another function of the, the webinar. If you can look at the top of your screen, you see there's a, a little icon with a hand up. And if you go to the arrow pointing down, um, you can go to uh, agree or disagree. So the question is, do you think that children today have uh, similar opportunities to have uh, to build these memories that you had yourself? So if you agree that they have the same opportunities, then, then, then hit agree. And if you disagree, um, okay, so I'm seeing... Good, good. Let's see what the general consensus is. I'm scrolling down. So it's looking like generally, and I know some of you might be in a room together with multiple people, so you're going to have to defer, I guess, to your senior person. <laughs> you can come to consensus quickly. Okay. It looks like the, the, the general sentiment is that, no, children don't have uh, similar experiences um, that we might have had growing up. And that's generally the, the kind of feedback that I've been getting um, in uh, in workshops and, and presentations uh, with people in front of me. So this this is great. It seems that we can have the same sort of interaction um, in this forum. Okay, so now I'm going to figure out how to change slides. So I work at Sunny Brook Health Sciences Center in Toronto as part of the Trauma, Emergency, and Critical Care Program. The RBC First Office for Injury Prevention has been driving injury prevention since 1986. So we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. PlaySafe is a registered program, and it's a, it's a baby by comparison. It was established in 2010 in our office. And this is what I do. This is my passion. Uh, and in this program, we get to explore the intersection of physical activity with injury and injury prevention. And there's a tension here, which I think is, is really exciting. Um, how do we promote physical activity on one hand while trying to prevent or minimize injuries on, on the other? And I think this um, generally in a public health unit is going to be a great topic of conversation because you have, um, you have, you have uh, separate um, but, but connected um, groups within your health units that are, are both looking at injury prevention and, of course, yourselves looking at um, physical activity promotion. And uh, I don't want you to be mistaken by the name play safe. We think that risk is an integral part of the human experience, and we promote it as a form of prevention. And I'll talk more about that shortly. So this is where I was raised, probably quite similar to, you, to many of you uh, on, on the call and, and the webinar today. Uh, dirt kicking, bike riding, come home when the streetlights come on, middle-class suburbia for me. I drank water out of a hose. I climbed trees. I fell off my bike. Uh, I rode in the backpack of a station wagon without a seatbelt. Uh, I ate snow, and I'm still here. But let's consider that my experience, which is probably quite similar to, to some of yours, is not the only experience, and that many young people uh, were seriously harmed or even died uh, along the way. So we have to keep in mind that there's a spectrum of childhood experience to consider. But then something happened. 
Somewhere along the way, we decided that public spaces did not belong to the people. Somewhere along the way, we decided that slow was better than fast, low was better than high, tepid was better than hot, dry was better than wet, and quiet was better than the loud ruckus. We decided that play should be organized, orderly, and supervised. We decided that safe is always better than sorry. We decided to eliminate all the hazards and all the risks by making things as safe as humanly possible. But this didn't happen overnight. And so in this slide, you'll see um, there's, there's a lot going on here, but I'll just explain to you that the, uh, this is the story of four generations of a family in the UK, and it's used to describe a situation that's, um, you know, been seen uh, across um, North America and uh, in different parts of Europe where children have had reduced um, uh, roaming distances from their house. So we've, we've, we've uh, started to shrink the, uh, the degree to which children can move away from their home in an unsupervised fashion. So in this particular story, it's four generations of one family. Um, Great-grandfather George was allowed to walk six miles um, to go fishing. Uh, and um, his son, Jack, was allowed to go one mile into the woods. And uh, Jack's daughter, Vicky, um, uh, and sorry, this is when everybody was eight years old. So uh, Vicky was allowed to walk half a mile to the swimming pool. And her son, Ed, um, at eight years of age, uh, was allowed to go 300 yards to the end of the street. So, uh, again, this is a story that we see over and over and over again of the, the shrinking space for people to go and explore the environment around them. Um, so uh, there's a, a number of reasons why this could be. And again, I'd ask that you just start popping some things into the chat box uh, and we'll see if we again get some general consensus around what are some of the societal reasons that you think contribute to this shrinking um, roaming distance that, uh, that children have available to them. Kidnapping, yes, safety concerns, Oh, white van syndrome, I like that. Um, uh, environmental differences, oh, that's interesting. Perceived safety. I, uh, perceived safety, I think that the key is the perceived uh, word, the helicopter syndrome. Um, ah, perception of being reported to the authorities. So that's speaking to the issue of parents being afraid to let their children uh, be away from them for fear that their neighbors will um, judge them and call the police. <laughs> is your family locked? For sure. Uh, we'll allow for... Uh, a few more. We've got a few more people typing. I've got the helicopter parenting, yes. Um, helicopter and, and bubble wrapping parents. Both parents working, yes. So uh, children uh, perhaps being in um, uh, child care centers. Otherwise, uh, uh, we know that a lot of people have shifted to having the structured playtime. So instead of the children being free to roam, um, to go to their activities that the parents will schedule times when they'll take them to their lessons, uh, street, uh, street dangers and vehicles. Okay, so um, I, want, I just want to talk about the word perceived. And I think when it comes to safety, there's a perception that, um, that children are at risk for abduction and injury. And, um, uh, and, and what we need to do is separate the reality from the perceptions. And we know that the chances of, uh, of, of random kidnappings are incredibly low, yet uh, it, it, it seems a, a risk that no parent is willing to, uh, to, to take. Um, people don't know their neighbors. Yes. So maybe just the way our communities are, are set up or the, and the way that people are working and not uh, socializing as much in their, in their neighborhoods contributes as well. So we, um, there are obviously a, a complex host of reasons why um, this shift has happened. And so part of the talk today is looking at ways that we can dial back some of these things. And, and one of the things I would suggest that we're uh, well positioned to address through public health is that perceived safety and making sure that people understand the realistic risks um, that their children face in uh, in, in, in participating in certain activities, but also the risk of not participating in, in physical activity. So we want to have a more balanced conversation. And uh, uh, this is a bit tongue in cheek, but uh, the, the stats bear out that more children are injured falling out of beds than falling out of trees each year. And we don't have a call to ban beds. Uh, when you think about fall hazards, air quality, 
our homes are dangerous, unhealthy places for all of us. So the idea that a child would be safer sitting on the couch playing a video game um, just doesn't bear out in the injury statistics. Uh, we know that, that uh, our homes being unhealthy is especially true for children and the elderly. So uh, I think it's important that we draw on the statistics that we have and look at them from, from every, every possible angle. And uh, again, it's a bit tongue in cheek, and, uh, but I think it illustrates a really important point. Um, that we, we can perhaps uh, let go of our, our fear of, of the trees and nature and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and encourage people to, uh, to be active outside and, and move away from the, the dangers that we find at home. Uh, again, looking at statistics um, and trends, uh, this slide uh, I like because it helps us to understand uh, a shift uh, in our healthcare burden. What used to kill us back in the 1900s was infectious disease. And now the things that are killing us uh, are, are chronic disease and injury. So we're concerned about heart disease and stroke, cancer, respiratory disease, and injuries, of course, being at the top of our, um, uh, our targets for uh, health care. And uh, the common thread between these leading causes is physical inactivity. We decided at some point that being physically active in our daily routine, walking to school, being active at work, walking to shop, they weren't for us anymore. We decided that instead of playing outside and going for a hike, we could join a gym, join a sport team, but otherwise be sedentary. Like Wonder Bread, we thought it was a good idea to make physical activity safe, convenient, and readily available. But in so doing, we removed a good amount of the beneficial experiences. So maybe it's our job now to figure out how to shift the experiences back to their original format while maintaining some of the conveniences that we now depend upon. So it's time to shift our thinking. And let's begin with that definition of risk. The term was originally conceived as a negative outcome in a business environment. But let's think about how this word permeates into our everyday lives. So when we're having conversations about walking to school, playing a particular sport, or playing at the park, we often use the word risk. This is a new slide. Um, I, had, I recently had an, uh, an aha moment uh, reading some uh, interesting uh, literature from the UK, and I, I hope that you find it interesting as well. Um, over the last several decades, we've applied the industrial or workplace model for, and strategy for risk and injury prevention to children at home, uh, at school, and at play. And I think it's fair to ask, when did we decide that industrial safety strategies had application to children's play programs and spaces? Uh, according to Ball, uh, Gill, and Spiegel, there's no developmental benefit to an industrial injury, but there is benefit for some play-related injuries. And if that's the case, then again, it begs the question, when did we decide that these industrial uh, strategies uh, were appropriate to apply to children's play spaces? Uh, I, I liberally use air quotations on the word risky and riskier. So um, you can't see me do that. But <laughs> I hope you'll just envision it. Um, how do we define risk in our activities in our, in our communities? Uh, as public health physical activity promoters, which activity presents the greatest risk in your mind? Is jumping out of a plane more risky than playing video games all day long? Um, um, I, I, what I want to do uh, is, is take a look, a closer look at this, at this word risk and, um, and, and, and how it's shifting and evolving uh, almost uh, you know, before our eyes. So back in, in 2009 now, uh, which is a little while ago, the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, um, uh, changed the, the definition. So it's no longer acceptable to consider only the negative part of the risk equation. And in this long overdue update, the definition of risk changed from chance or probability of loss to the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And this change is important because it frames risk as both potentially negative and positive. And we can use this language to begin to neutralize our preconceived ideas about certain activities and the impact these values have on our activity choices. So keep in mind, I, I am uh, a certified risk manager, um, so <laughs> I love this stuff. I know it, it can often put people to sleep, but uh, I think it's pretty important. And um, and also, having studied public health and spending time in a public health unit last summer, um, uh, I think it informs this, this new framework, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to share it with you and, and uh, look forward to your feedback. Um, 
So the, the aim of, of this framework is to move away from labeling certain activities as, again, air quotes, risky, and promote a new dialogue. In this framework, we can position any activity in a neutral position, and then we can consider the potential negative and positive outcomes. So we're going to go back to the chat box again. I want somebody, so whoever whoever gets in there first, to name an activity, any activity, uh, type it into the chat box, and then we'll, um, we'll see if we can come up with a list of potential negative outcomes and potential positive outcomes. So it can be a physical activity. Oh, good. Landon, Landon uh, Public Health, climbing a tree. Okay, perfect. So we're not going to say that climbing a tree is a risky activity because we know that there's connotations associated with using that word risky and, uh, uh, and, and, and defining people as risk takers. So let's just call climbing a tree, climbing a tree. It's an activity. So let's talk about the potential positive outcomes that come from climbing a tree. So if we can uh, use the chat box again. What are some of the potential positive outcomes associated with climbing a tree? All right, land in public health. Oh, good. We've got some other people contributing here. Multiple attendees are typing. Let's see what we come up with. Building up for body strength. Good. So some physical health. Learn about trees. <laughs> That's a nice benefit. That's an accomplishment. These are beautiful. Balancing. It is fun. Coordination. All right. I really appreciate everybody contributing. Gross motor development achievement, test your limits, flexibility, physical or safe course. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, yes, cooperation if you're helping your friends. That's awesome. <laughs> you can make a meal out of it too. Thank you, Julie. Understanding your limits. This is perfect. Awesome. Okay. So uh, these are fantastic. You can keep typing if you wish. Um, so let's talk now about the potential negative outcomes of climbing a tree. Oh, I like the just because. So what are some of the potential negative outcomes associated with climbing a tree? Uh, I would also like to point out that we had about a million positive uh, potential outcomes. Broken bones, slivers, concussion, you could fall, splinters, dislocated shoulder. Marty Paul's getting very specific with the injuries. <laughs> He's fine, yes. Okay. Judged by neighbors. Yes. This is great. There's a lot of a lot of cooperation here happening, um, and, and it is so quiet. <laughs> it's a little unnerving, but uh, I'm enjoying um, uh, the participation. Not uh, getting in trouble because you went too high. Getting getting stuck at the top. Well, I I don't know about you, but um, people usually figure out a way to get back down. Uh, either because they've fallen or because they've just figured it out. But uh, at least most of my friends, I think, are back down from the top of trees. But that's true. And I think that that feeling that you have when you're stuck at the top of the tree or where you've taken that extra, you've gone that extra um, climb and you're you're feeling a little uncomfortable, that's uh, a really important opportunity for learning. Okay. So um, thank you again for uh, for contributing to the activity. Um, I think we can see that there are a tremendous number of potential positive outcomes, and I'd like to think that they were a bit more varied in terms of them being uh, physical, social, emotional, uh, nutritional, <laughs> um, and educational. Uh, I think on the potential negative outcomes, uh, if I could generalize, I would say that uh, most of them are associated with potential for injury. Um, so that's just something interesting to note. So the second part of this model is talking about the key influencing factors, um, and and you can and I've tried to demonstrate that by um, their variability by having them in bold or having them smaller uh, or bigger. Um, so in this model, the influencing factors can change based on the activity or the varying circumstances. And by placing the activity in a neutral position, we can begin to have more intentional conversations about managing potential outcomes and address the influencing factors. More so, moving away from the value-laden terminology helps to reduce the alienation or destigmatizing of young people in particular who may have already tried certain behaviors. So let's move away from labeling the person as a risk taker or their activities as risky and just simply talk about the activities and the potential positive or potential negative outcomes. Oh my goodness, and my computer just did something funny. Hopefully, that didn't... Uh, 
affect the presentation. So now I'm going to confuse you a little bit because I'm going to follow up on a piece uh, that talks about why we should move away from labeling activities as risky to introducing a topic called risky play. You can't, again, you can't see my air quotes, but please envision them literally. So the term risky play was coined by Norwegian researcher Ellen Sandfeder, and her pivotal work on children and the concept of risky play is groundbreaking and points to a new direction in promoting physical activity in a way most appropriate for children. Sandfeder presented risky play at the 2013 Canadian Injury Prevention and Safety Promotion and Conference, uh, sorry, the, the Canadian Injury Prevention and Safety Promotion Conference in Montreal. So keep in mind that we're, we're only three years into this. The BC Injury Research and Prevention Unit have continued to drive the concept of risky play for injury prevention. Yes, I said risk for prevention and have published on the topic with colleagues from across Canada. The term is gaining traction across the country in many fields, including recreation and physical activity organizations, healthcare, and injury prevention, to name a few. So, uh, by a show of hands, how many people have heard of uh, the term risky play? Uh, you can just raise your hand using our little icon at the top of the screen. Quite, quite so. Not quite half. All right. So, um, it might be. Some of this will be new, and then some of this will be um, just reinforcing some of the stuff that you've already heard uh, about the topic. So what is it? Uh, for the purposes of the systematic review, for Sony and others, defined risky play as thrilling and exciting play that can include the possibility of physical injury. It sounds like the childhood that most of us would have experienced. And risky play itself, as Ellen Sansetter describes it, is comprised of six characteristics. Um, let's see. Here we go. Great height. So this includes climbing and jumping. High speed includes swinging, sliding, sledding, things of that nature. These are fun ones. The dangerous tools, using saws, knives, axes, and ropes. That's usually usually gets people all twisted and not just even saying those words out loud. But um, again, thinking back to those childhood experiences that many of us had, if you went camping or you played in the woods or you, uh, you know, had a back backyard um, uh, with access to some of these things, you may have played just like uh, this young girl was playing uh, on the, on the image. Dangerous elements. Uh, this includes playing around cliffs, uh, water, uh, fire, Rough and tumble play includes wrestling, stick play, things of that nature. Um, I love the, the stick play the, in the bottom image where they've taken some sticks and they're just envisioning uh, some epic battle. Uh, many of us have had that, that experience. Uh, the opportunity to get lost uh, or disappear. This includes exploring alone or an unfamiliar area. I want you to keep in mind that these are all from the child's perspective. This is not uh, permission to not supervise children uh, or to expose children to hazards, which are quite distinct from the risks uh, that we're talking about. Um, so, again, these, this is from the child's perspective, that the child, in this instance, with the opportunity to get lost, the child feels that they are unsupervised in the moment. So, um, perhaps they're playing in an area where there's boulders or trees or areas where they can be behind something and not in the direct view of the adult who's supervising the activity. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of risky play. Evidence suggests that exposing young children to low levels of risk repeatedly, where they can learn to negotiate, experience mistakes, and develop the skills necessary to be successful in their chosen activity leads to a variety of benefits that we can all agree are important for healthy outcomes. Further, we know that these benefits extend to youth under the same circumstances of repeated low-risk exposure. You don't want a teenager's first risk-taking experience to be at a party or in the driver's seat of, of a car. So you might still be concerned about injury consequences. Uh, that's understandable. Um, I think it's, it's fair to also ask, in your own communities, you know what the injury rate is. Uh, calculating the exposure rate to get a better understanding of the actual risk of injury versus just the count of the injury incidents alone. Um, so do you have access to that information? Can you work with your epidemiologist 
to understand not just the simple count of injury, but, um, but what that means within the context of your population. According to Dr. Bersoni, a child would need to play for three hours a day for 10 years before recording an injury that requires medical attention, and the injury is likely at worst to be a fracture. So given that, uh, is it time to ask the question, are minor injuries acceptable in the view of overall population health? And, uh, and that's something that we can talk about perhaps in the, the Q&A section. But again, I mentioned at the, at the top of the, uh, the presentation uh, that I like to agitate. And I think that question is a fair question um, that every public health unit can start to explore is, is what is the threshold? And what does it mean to have a population that's more physically active yet exposed perhaps to minor injury uh, compared to a population that's sedentary and is exposed to the risk of chronic disease? I, I'm, I'm certain that all of you are familiar with the position statement on active outdoor play, so I won't speak to it too much. I think that there's some magic here in this position statement, um, and that it was not only was it informed by Sam Setter's work, but the, the key is that it was developed by healthy child development and injury prevention experts and endorsed by a variety of organizations. So the fact that we have these sectors that are coming together um, and considering the injury aspect of outdoor and risky play is, is, is pretty magical uh, from my perspective. So what does this mean for physical activity promoters in, in public health? What does it mean for your health unit? How can you begin to incorporate some of these concepts into your, into your work? Does it make sense for you to include elements of risky play in your activities? Maybe you're already doing so. And can you shift your programming slightly to incorporate some of these principles? So I just want to leave you with this question um, in, in terms of going back to your, your department um, and your colleagues and even within society itself is looking at what, uh, what risky play means um, in public health. So I have some other questions, um, and we can, we can also look at these during the Q&A uh, section of the presentation. Uh, but these questions I've been asking in previous presentations with different audiences um, to, uh, to generate some conversation about the fit of risky play promotion and organization, what's needed to include it, and what are some of the easy wins or low-hanging fruit. So in terms of looking at, you know, question number one, where does risky play fit into your unit division, vision, mission, and or values? So does, does it have a fit? Does, does any of this make sense with, with what you're um, – with your mandate, and, and I think it's particularly relevant in public health to to see how this concept, which to me is, is challenging uh, both the injury prevention and the, the uh, physical activity promotion um, uh, departments uh, in a public health unit, I, I think that would just be a fascinating conversation to, uh, to be part of. What do you need within your organization or from an external organization to facilitate the inclusion of risky play? So are there pieces that would be helpful to the public health unit or public health units um, as a whole to help support the, uh, the concept of risky play in um, public health physical activity promotion? And the third question speaks to some of the easy wins. So how do you increase access to risky play opportunities for children and youth in your area? What were those first steps? So it's, uh, sometimes people consider this to be a question of um, program development. And I would caution that uh, it's probably too soon for that kind of work. But what can you do in your department to sort of lay the groundwork for, um, for risky play opportunities in your community? What does that look like? It, it might include things like um, agenda setting and uh, sharing education within your department itself. Um, but these are the kinds of things that I think are important to consider uh, within, your, within your department. And again, we can talk about these. I think uh, I'll be wrapping up in a, in a couple of minutes, so that'll give us a little bit of extra time in the Q&A uh, if, if you've got questions or we'll want to discuss this, uh, particularly because we've got uh, a nice group uh, online. Um, but here's one example of something that's tangible that you can start to share within your communities. I really like this piece. Um, I think uh, in, in terms of uh, contrasting this with the, the framework that I showed you earlier, which was a bit more conceptual in nature, uh, this is a very tangible, uh, accessible community piece 
um, that helps to create the balanced conversation within a community. Um, and it's our job to manage the potential negative uh, outcomes in our activities and programs and maximize the potential positive uh, outcomes. And so the Play Safety Forum in the UK has developed a risk-benefit analysis tool, and I'm going to provide the links uh, to, um, to these and other resources. And it takes into account both the potential negative outcomes, which they refer to as risks, and the potential positive outcomes that they refer to as benefits. In addition, it looks at relevant local factors such as history and culture, precedents, and comparisons to other jurisdictions. While the previous, uh, I've already mentioned that about the previous framework. Um, and so I, I, I think uh, this is a great piece for you to have a look at and start sharing with your recreation department. And what it does is it moves the conversation away from one person in a department that feels a certain way about certain activities. And, and broadens the conversation and brings more people to the table and brings in some expert, um, um, or some expertise around certain activities. So if you want to, you know, if you were suggesting introducing a new uh, activity in a school or in a community center, um, that you would have the ability to bring in an expert on that particular activity that could share some of the factors that help reduce the risk of injury. Um, and, and help uh, the group to make a decision. But it really, it really helps to contextualize the activity within the community and, um, uh, and, 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 and really promotes the concept of a balanced conversation and takes into account the benefits uh, of, of the activity. So as, as we saw in that previous example of the tree climbing, there was just a, a beautiful list of potential benefits um, and, and those can't get lost in the conversation when we're talking about an activity that might make some people feel uncomfortable. Because when it comes to addressing some of those injury risks with climbing a tree, uh, just on our own, we can probably come up with some mitigating strategies that wouldn't um, deny children the opportunity to climb the tree, but could help them to do it in a way that would reduce the likelihood of them being injured. I hope that makes some sense. So just to summarize, I think it's important that we shift away from the old way of thinking about risk. We need to reframe it as potentially positive and negative. And we need to manage the negative and acknowledge and promote the heck out of the positive. So that's the real magic is that we're promoting the positive aspects of, of these activities. We want to encourage risky elements in play spaces and programs. And we start to engage children in the ability to develop their risk management uh, and their risk competency skills. Uh, including critical thinking and, and through this, the development of resilience. And we want to, most importantly, remember that we should be making spaces and programs as safe as necessary, not as safe as possible. And I wanted to finish with a, a quick quote that I think is, is really important. Children and young people need to encounter some real risks if they are to respond positively to challenging situations and learn how to deal with, the, with uncertainty. And this can't be achieved by limiting them to supposedly safe environments. Therefore, providers of play opportunities have no choice but to offer situations in which children and young people can experience real, not make-believe hazards. And I want to thank you all very much for this opportunity. Uh, there's a strong network of people working on this topic, and we'd love to hear from you and the work that you're doing in your community. So please feel free to connect with me about any questions or challenges that come up along the way. And like I mentioned earlier, this is early days uh, for this topic, um, but it is exciting and it's challenging and it's, um, as I mentioned before, agitating. It's going to make people feel really uncomfortable and uh, and and. and Maybe that's why I like it so much, but it really challenges the status quo. And I think it's time to consider those experiences that we had. We need to ensure that we don't lose a, a generation of children that uh, have been denied these opportunities, um, that we provide them with the ability to explore the environments around them um, and, and enjoy uh, some of the fun activities that we had and, and enjoy the benefits that we, we all experienced from those. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's a list of resources, and I think you're going to get a copy or have access to the slide deck itself. So you've got all of the links to um, the resources that, that I've referred to uh, throughout the presentation. So with that, 
I, I don't know how we do this, but we can open up for questions, um, comments, discussion. How are we for time? I think I finished about five or six minutes early, so. Oh, we're going to add questions to the chat box. Yeah, thanks, Brandy. This is Sarah again. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm seeing at least one hand raised in the participant list. So if people want to just start typing their questions into the chat box, that's usually um, how we facilitate the question and answer. Oh, excellent question. What is P oh, PD? Uh, where is PD? Is that Peterborough District? I don't, I'm not sure PDH is. It doesn't matter. Um, you can let me know. I, I would actually like to know. How do we combat the fear of litigation after a child is injured at a school? So there at Perth District, thank you very much. Um, there is uh, there's some good work that's coming out of BC and uh, the Canadian Public Health Association specifically addressing the, uh, the litigation, um, both from the, the actual event of a child being injured and from uh, the perception of litigation that may um, uh, see an organization choosing to not participate in certain activities. So I would say that information is, uh, is, is uh, near to being shared. Um, and I will endeavor to find some information that I can share with you, um, perhaps by uh, attaching it to uh, an additional slide deck. But there is good information, particularly in BC. There was a recent um, a court case that involved um, uh, a parent suing a municipality around an injury, and, uh, um, and, and it would be quite helpful in, in, in illuminating that whole that whole piece. There have been discussions around using adventures. Oh yes, the language and using loose parts instead of dangerous elements. I, I think the, the so the language piece. There are a few different camps. Um, I, I'm, uh, uh, as a risk manager, I think it's important that we use the word risk and that we address it as it is currently, um, particularly in light of the fact that the research that Ellen Sandsetter uh, conducted uh, defined the term risky play. So I think it's important um, that we address the issue that people are un uncomfortable with the word, that we help to shift some of the beliefs around the word. Um, but that we also consider some of the communication uh, with parents in particular uh, around that word. So I think within our organizations and as we have these internal conversations that we, um, we, we don't worry so much about the language as we do about the information that we want to share and how these concepts integrate into our programs, um, but that we, you know, keep in mind the, the marketing piece. And, and what that might look like. And it, it's, it, it's possible that it could look different. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think it's, it's early days and it would be too soon to change the language simply because we don't like the word or we feel that it has a particular connotation within the community. Um, so I, 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 would, I would just caution against that. Don't, don't get hung up on the language quite yet. Consider the, the concept first. And uh, I, I can tell you that there is a lot of conversation around the country about that, that very concern. So um, it would be great if we could uh, come to a consensus around it. Uh, it would also be great if we could just shift uh, some knowledge within our communities around that word. And, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, sort of devaluing um, and neutralizing the activities. How do you suggest working with school boards? Because there is always the big L. <laughs> Um, being used when kids do anything outside. I, I think it's really important that we draw on the statistics that we have available to us. And um, I think if we were to look at the number of children participating in physical activity during recess, for instance, or playing tag, I think we would see that the number of injuries per, you know, number of children um, uh, participating would be, would be quite low, would be almost insignificant. And so I think looking at the actual injury rates as opposed to the perception of injury rates is a very important piece. I think uh, there was, um, there's some good examples of, uh, um, I think in the city of Toronto where they eliminated ball throwing, um, uh, throwing balls uh, at recess and uh, Rex Murphy does a great video. So if you just Google Rex Murphy and um, balls at recess, 
or something along those lines, you'll find his video and he really nicely um, captures the lunacy of some of the decisions to eliminate um, opportunities for children to be physically active uh, at recess in particular. So there's, there's lots of ways to manage uh, injury risk. Um, but eliminating the physical activity uh, is, is really problematic. So I would definitely caution against that. And, and again, always drawing on the injuries. And, and when we can start to pull up numbers like more children fall out of beds than fall out of trees, then people start to see um, you know, the reality of the situation. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Chantal. It's, it's a great, great video. You can use it in every presentation if you haven't already. And somebody recently banned tag. I can't remember who it was. They allow flag football still, but they banned tag. This is Sarah again. I'm just going to jump in quickly, but feel free to keep adding your questions to the chat box. Um, and just while we, the Q &A, sorry, while we finish the q and A, I'm just going to encourage you guys to take a minute to complete the webinar um, evaluation that we have for PARC. This is your chance to tell us what you thought and also to recommend future topics for future webinars. Um, so while we finish up the Q&A, I'm just going to ask you to take a minute to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Danielle, um, I don't know that there's data published. I will look for it, but through Sport for Life, I know that that's um, uh, a particular interest is looking at uh, physical literacy skills and um, and injuries. Uh, so I think it, it might be a matter of staying tuned, but um, I think there's reason to believe that uh, physical literacy skills contributes to the competence and confidence that would allow a child to um, participate in a way that would re reduce their injury risk. I think that's definitely fair to say. And um, uh, uh, we know that the, that they're, uh, you know, they, they improve when they when they have physical literacy training, which sounds a bit contradictory, but when they ex experience a physical literacy intervention, we know that it improves their um, their, their gross motor skills in a number of ways um, that would, again, um, speak to their risk for injury. Uh, but I, I don't know that there's actual data on, on the injuries. So that's, that's something to look at. You are welcome. I wish I had more information on that. Oh, we do have, um, would you believe that there's a connection between physical literacy skills and injury? And so we're exploring that. And one of the, the areas that, that, uh, that I'm looking at specifically is physical literacy um, as a predictor of physical activity in uh, patients that have experienced a knee replacement surgery. So physical literacy is one of the ways that we're measuring physical activity predictors. And so we're hoping to show that um, uh, there may be differences in physical literacy skills or other variables that may affect physical activity participation uh, in people who are at risk for um, falls, uh, if, if they haven't already. Um, or at the very least, uh, they're not as physically active uh, following surgery as we would like them to be that would have an impact on their risk for uh, chronic disease. So I think it's, it's early days, um, especially around physical literacy and uh, exploring how it impacts in, in lots of uh, areas of, of health and healthcare. But we're hoping to see that it will happen more frequently and that there will be a, a lot more research to, to show the importance of developing these physical literacy skills. Are there any more questions? Oh, great. Um, if there aren't any more, then uh, again, I want to thank you, uh, Allison and Chris and Sarah, for all the support today. And uh, I want to wish you good luck in uh, the meeting that follows. Again, you've got my, um, my email information, so please feel free to connect and uh, continue the conversation. Uh, and I'm going to jump off shortly um, and leave you to your meeting. All right. Thank you very much, Brandy. And thank you, everyone, for participating in the webinar. It was definitely a very interesting presentation. Um, so, you know, as Brandy said, feel free to connect with her with any follow-up questions. Feel free to connect with us at Park for all things physical activity related.